So we are going to have Alex up, but before I would like to invite him up, um, I would love to have Dory Trimble join me. And she's the executive director of the Honnold Foundation, and she's going to help me introduce Alex. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us, Dory. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so first of all, can you just tell us a little bit about what the Honnold Foundation does? Yeah, absolutely. So the Honnold Foundation promotes solar energy for a more equitable world. Um, so what that means is that we provide grants and project management support and a storytelling spotlight to nonprofits all over the world, mostly in the Americas, who are using solar energy to make people's lives better. That's amazing, thank you. Uh, so what's it like uh, working with Alex on these projects? <laughs> Um, it's been really good for my fitness, um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, he's a really great person to work with. Um, I think that we talk a lot about authenticity, um, and I think that people say that word so much that it's kind of lost its meaning, um, mm -hmm. but there really isn't a better word to describe the way that Alex approaches his things. Mm -hmm. Like, if he thinks something is stupid, he will tell you, um, which makes it really easy to move forward because there's a lot of clarity around what we want. Um, and when we do this work, the thing that we're the most passionate about is using solar energy to reduce environmental impact and improve people's lives. And so having that really clear path um, and having a founder who's so passionate about that path and giving us the tools to reach it, um, it's, it's kind of a privilege, honestly. That's amazing. Uh, so can we get a show of hands of who has seen Free Solo? Oh, wow, that's, that's overwhelming, okay. Uh, maybe Dory can tell us something about Alex that maybe we didn't learn in Free Solo. Okay, um, so you guys all saw the van in Free Solo, right? You've seen the van. So um, Alex created the foundation in 2012. Um, so this is way before Free Solo, it's way before the Academy Award, it's way before he was like regular person famous. Um, and back then he lived in a different van, and that was a van that you couldn't stand up in. Um, it was like a, like a painter van, basically. Um, still nice on the inside, but like a very different scene. Um, and back then, he also didn't have a house, so he was like fully a homeless person living in a van. And um, that's when he started the foundation. And I think a really cool thing that he usually doesn't talk about, um, but that I think is a story that should get told more, is that the foundation didn't happen when he got famous. The foundation happened a long time ago. Um, and when he created it, he created it by giving away a third of his annual income. So if you guys think about how much money you make in a year, and then you think about taking 33% of it and just giving it away to causes that you're passionate about, also while being homeless. Um, <laughs> it, it's a pretty cool position, and uh, I think that that's a, that's a fun Alex fact that doesn't get talked about enough. That's amazing, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So yeah, this is, we're gonna you know, witness really somebody that has taken their passion for climbing, made a career out of it, and now has done, done so much good with it. So um, we are gonna cue the uh, free solo trailer for those that haven't seen it, and then we'll welcome Alex to the stage. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Does it feel different to be up there without a rope? It's obviously like much higher consequence. People who know a little bit about climbing, they're like, oh, he's totally safe. And then people who really know exactly what he's doing are freaked out. I've thought about El Cap like for years and every yeah. year I'm like, that's really scary. I'll never be content unless I at least put in the effort. El Cap is the most impressive wall on Earth. It's 3,200 feet of sheer granite. It's the center of the rock climbing universe. Obviously, I get interview questions about it all the time. Oh, would you like to do that? And you're like, yes, for sure. So you're a girlfriend now, I heard. It's awesome. <laughs> Pretty much makes life better in every way. It's really hard for me to grasp why he wants this. But if he doesn't do this stuff, he'd regret it. Everybody who has made free soloing a big part of their life is dead now. I haven't been injured in like seven years. I suddenly start getting injured all the time. What if something happens? <laughs> what if I don't see him again? I could just walk away, but it's like, I don't want to. I've always been conflicted about shooting a film about free soloing just because it's so dangerous. It's hard to not imagine your friend falling through the frame to his death. I think when he's free soloing, that's when he feels the most alive, the most everything. How can you even think about taking it away from somebody? No mistakes tomorrow. 
starting to get kind of psyched. If you're pushing the edge, eventually you find the edge. I can't believe you guys actually can watch. Hey Jimmy, do you copy? You just started climbing. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming. Honestly, after, after the introduction from Michelle and Dory and hearing them talk about things that are a lot more important than rock climbing, I sort of want to just go sit down and watch them speak for the rest of the day. But, um, but instead, I will subject you guys to a little chat about rock climbing. So, you know, maybe a little bit less significant in the grand scheme of things than, uh, than some of the other things we've been discussing today, but, but I am going to try to dive into the why of it a little bit, obviously, in the spirit of, of this event. And, uh, I spent the last six, seven months touring with the film Free Solo. I, I saw many of you guys have already seen the film, and so, um, you know, first appreciate that, and thank you guys. But, um, so I spent a lot of time touring with the film and talking a lot about the, the how, the preparation behind it, you know, how I trained for the climb, what it felt like, things like that, but, uh, you know, in the spirit of today's event, I'll, I'll try to dive a little bit more into the why. But that's, that's obviously a challenging question with climbing, but, um, but, you know, I'll do my best. Let's see how it goes. If, if it sucks, throw things at me. I'll get off the stage. Um, no problem. So, oh, so this is the mighty El Cap. You know, so, uh, so I'll, I'll actually just start at the beginning and kind of take you through the whole journey up to El Cap. And so, so those that have seen the film, uh, you've seen the two years of, of direct preparation and, and training that I put into the actual climb. But what the film doesn't really show are the uh, maybe 17 years before that that I spent uh, learning how to climb, improving and climbing, pushing myself down this path. I mean, really the film focuses on the very end of this l very long journey. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today a little bit. And so that journey began as, as a little kid climbing for fun. You know, I just always loved the sensation of climbing. And I think that, that really that's something I'll probably touch on throughout this presentation is that at the core of all of it, the why for me behind climbing is a love of the actual climbing, the, the sensation of the feeling of it, the the air around me, holding on to little things, the movement in the body. I mean, there's an elemental movement to it, sort of like running or swimming or uh, anything. I mean, you know, we are apes. So we, should, we should be able to climb. Uh, and I, actually, out of curiosity, how many of you guys climb? I'm sure some must. I mean, okay, that's actually slightly sad because there is world-class climbing all around here. And I feel like there's a... Uh, I've, I've spent four summers in, uh, in Squamish, just up the road from here, uh, climbing. And it's slightly distressing that nobody else here climbs. But... But maybe after seeing this, you guys will go to the gym. I mean, I went to the climbing gym this morning to train. It's not, it's not that far. I feel like we should all walk there afterward. But so actually, speaking of the climbing gym, so that was a natural transition for me. Uh, I, I grew up in Sacramento, California. And I was lucky enough that a gym opened in my hometown when I was 10, maybe. And my parents read about it in the newspaper. This is back when climbing gyms were, were sort of a rarity. And so a, a climbing gym opening was a bit of a thing. And so. I, I was lucky enough to start going to the climbing gym. My parents thought that it would be a nice structured way for me to climb in, in a safer setting, you know, better than climbing on my school or the church nearby. Or, you know, there were a couple of structures around home that I would frequently uh, play on. And so the climbing gym w was a better way. So I basically spent from the age of 10 to 18 bicycling to the climbing gym, spending the whole afternoon climbing, biking home. And so, you know, that's a great way to learn the technical skills of climbing to to enjoy. You know, it's almost like playing. It's like playing on a playground, except that, you know, there are more rules behind it about how you use your hands and feet and things like that. But so while I was growing up in the climbing gym, you know, it's funny because the, the gym is so safe and, and sterile to some extent, but you're still immersed in climbing culture. I was still reading the magazines, watching the films, uh, you know, looking at posters, you know, all, all the things. I was still aware of the greater climbing world, even though I wasn't actually going to the mountains and climbing big rocks. And so growing up, one of my big heroes was, was a fellow named Peter Croft, who's actually a strong, proud Canadian. Have any of you guys heard of Peter? He's in the film. He's the older fellow in the film that, that, uh, that I chat with quite a bit. But so he was a legend when I was a child, and, uh, and he's, he's from here, though he moved down to California because it's better climbing and better weather. So just, you know. But um, so he had sold many things in Yosemite. Uh, and, and honestly, there was a poster in the men's room, I think, of, the, of the, my climbing gym. So every time I went to the men's room, I was like, that's Peter climbing this route. Like, he's the man. He, and he was free soloing. He was climbing without a rope. Uh, he, that's what he was most known for. And so fast forward many years of, of my childhood. Um, I went to UC Berkeley for a year and was studying engineering and wasn't really that passionate about it. And uh, I wouldn't say that I, 
I never officially dropped out, but I, I just never actually went back. So it's you know it's so, sort of the same thing. I didn't you know I didn't decide that I wasn't going to go anymore. I just never never went. And so, um, but what I did do was was borrow <laughs> actually in the same way indefinitely borrow my mom's minivan and uh, start road tripping around California, climbing outside. And after a couple years of of that, going further afield, uh, you know, pushing myself a little bit more, climbing bigger rocks, taking on different challenges, eventually. Uh, I climbed this route, which I included just because uh, this is sort of a scrappy photo. You can see I'm climbing over some other, photo, uh, other folks in this picture. Uh, there's a rope below me and a guy with a helmet down below. And uh, So the guy that took this picture, basically two guys were climbing with a rope on this route, and I just happened to climb through them that day. And this is, pre, you know, this is before I was a sponsored climber, before there were photographers, before there was anything, before I was sponsored by anybody. Uh, you know, I just happened to be out climbing by myself, and there were two random guys on the route, and they took this picture, and then I ran into one of them on the bus, and so he gave me this photo. And so it's one of the few pictures that I have that's fully from, you know, unprofessional. It's just like this random picture of the day out. But I include this because that's really at the heart of free soloing, is to go out and have an adventure by yourself on, on a wall. And, and that's really, you know, as I said, I'd grown up in the climbing gym looking up to people like Peter Croft, l sort of admiring admiring free soloing. And free soloing, just to be clear, is, is one small aspect of climbing. You know, there are many ways to climb. You know, some people go ice climbing, some people climb mountains. For whatever reason, I was drawn to free soloing as a part of climbing. You know, I was, I was doing all other aspects as well, but this was an important part to me. And as I practiced it more and as I got better at it, I found that it was a very rewarding part of climbing. In some ways, free soloing has always sort of felt like the final exam of climbing to me. Uh, you know, you, you practice, you train, and then you sort of test yourself against what it is that you have practiced for. And, and I like that. I mean, when you climb with a rope, uh, you know, the consequences aren't the same. Like, uh, obviously. <laughs> okay, that sounds, <laughs> that was dumb. But, um, you know, I don't really know how to say it, but, but every once in a while, it feels good to test your skill. And so, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure some of you guys must ski and occasionally, you, I don't know, does anybody ski? Nobody climbed, but. Um, yeah, okay, that's, that's good enough. I mean, I guess I could equate it to, uh, to skiing. You know, every once in a while you want to do some steep skiing where you actually have to make precise turns. You're required to make the turn or else you're gonna potentially, you know, wreck and, and tear both your ACLs or whatever. Um, I, I don't really like to ski that much because I don't want to tear my ACL, but I'd rather save it for climbing. All that to say, so this route was, um, th th when I was talking about seeing a poster of Peter Croft in the men's room, it was actually on this route. This is a route called the Rostrum. And so as I grew up, this route represented the limit of what had been done in free soloing. Uh, Peter had done two big climbs like this in Yosemite. This is one of them. And so I grew up thinking that this represented the edge of human potential. I was like, this is, this is outrageous. And so I'd always been dreaming about it. I'd always looked up to this, this specific climb. And so when I was 22, I repeated it. Uh, you know, I'd climbed it with a rope, I felt comfortable on it, and, and so I was able to do it. And so then that left me in an interesting position that, you know, I had now done the things that, that my heroes had done, and it was kind of up to me to choose my own path and, and follow, you know, go in whatever direction I felt comfortable. And so that led me to, to this route, which is uh, in Zion National Park. I don't know if any of you guys have been, but it's a, it's a really beautiful park in the, in the U.S. And so this is a 1,000-foot route. Actually, would you guys prefer if I use Imperial or Metric? It's like, does anyone have strong opinions? I'll, I'll go Metric. This is, this is a 300-meter route, and it's a, I can do whichever grades you want to for difficulty. No. So, so this, is a, this is a pretty hard climb, and it had never been free soloed before. It's, uh, it's, it's difficult. But the thing about this climb is that the style actually suited me perfectly. And so I know this looks totally outrageous. It's just this, this one inch, oh, I guess that's a 2.5 centimeter crack. <laughs> And so, <laughs> so this two and a half centimeter crack that runs for 300 meters up this, up this buttress. Uh, I'm gonna stick to Imperial, I apologize. But so, uh, the thing about this though, is that even though it's really sheer and exposed, when you put your fingers into the crack, you do actually feel locked into the mountain. And, and for whatever reason, I've always felt particularly secure in finger cracks, particularly good at crack climbing. It's just, it suits me well. And so even though this was quite a bit bigger and quite a bit harder than anything that had been free soloed before, the thing is I felt very comfortable when I practiced it. I felt, you know, I, I just knew that I could do it. I could do it on a rope, I, I felt good. And in a lot of ways, it was also the best possible route to free solo. It's, uh, it was the, the most fun kind of route to free solo because there's so much air around me. You can see how there's so little of my 
my, my body in the mountain even. It's just a couple fingertips and just the tips of my toes that aren't even on edges or anything. They're just pasted against the wall. And yet I still felt totally safe. And really that's the, maybe the, the best sensation in free soloing for me is that, that combination of being in what should be an extreme position but feeling totally in control while you're there. And so, you know, I'll, I'll get back to that throughout my presentation. I mean, there are many climbs that, uh, but where I've had that, that sensation. But really, that, that might be one of the things at the core of my desire to solo, is to, to take a position that seems like it should be outrageous, but then to feel totally comfortable being there. And so I did this climb in 2008, just by total coincidence. Uh, it happened to be on April 1st, and so it got reported as, as an April Fool's joke. And it, you know, I was, as Dory said, I was living in my car, had no idea what month it was, and it was just kind of like, oh, you know, that's, that's weird, <laughs> whatever. Um, and so as soon as I did it, though, the, the obvious, you know, everybody was like, what's next? You know, and, and I was sort of like, okay, well, I did that. It felt easy for me. What's the next challenge? And that's, you know, I mean, if I'm talking about the why behind free soloing, I mean, that's kind of the, and this is something I've always sort of struggled with, and I don't really have great answers for, but the sort of perpetual motion, you know, you do something that's challenging for you, you increase your skills a little bit, now you need something a little more challenging, a little more challenging. And, and in some ways, that's a very rewarding cycle because you're constantly building, or at least for me, it's been rewarding because I'm constantly building skills, improving what I do, and seeking out bigger challenges. But in other ways, I've always been slightly wary of getting stuck on the, you know, on the achievement treadmill, where you're just like running faster and faster to stay in place, doing harder and harder things. And with climbing, particularly, I've had at this point, I've had a lot of friends die in climbing accidents or die, you know, in base jumping accidents or basically just die in the mountains. And and I realized that at some point you have to get off the treadmill. I mean, you can't just keep trying to one up yourself because you know you run into your own physical limits and, and you run into the limits of human potential and things. And so, you know, obviously the real challenge with this is knowing when you're taking an important step forward and, and, and growing and when you're trying to overreach and, and it's potentially too dangerous. And, uh, you know, obviously I don't have a great answer around that, but I've always tried to take conservative steps forward. And so in 2008 for me, the, ne the next step forward was, was Half Dome, which, uh, have, have many of you guys been to Yosemite? Huh, that's, that's bleak. But uh, I suppose, uh, <laughs> I suppose when you have Squamish just up the road, it's like, oh, why go all the way down south when you have something half as cool just up the road? <laughs> but, um, but, but so Half Dome is a 600-meter face, and it's about 800 meters above the valley floor. You can see it's, it's a, a very big wall set very high above the valley floor. And so it presented several challenges in, in terms of preparation. Uh, the, the last climb that I showed you, actually, I'll just go back. So this route... Uh, you know, it's only 300 meters high, but it actually has a paved trail to the summit, so it was very easy for me to hike to the top, rappel down the face, work on it by myself. I could, I could uh, practice the climbing at my own leisure. I could spend my time on it. I worked it until I felt totally comfortable, and then I was able to free soul it. The thing with Half Dome is that it's just a much bigger undertaking to get up there. It's way bigger. It's way further back. I didn't even own that much rope. You know, there's no obvious way for me to rappel down and practice the climbing because I just, I don't know, the scale was too big. And so, to sort of avoid that, that issue, I just uh, decided to go up there with, with minimal preparation. You know, I, was, uh, I, I framed it as I'll just preserve the adventure. Uh, you know, I'll rise to the occasion, it'll be great. But, um, but so I did the bare minimum preparation, which was going up there with a friend, uh, a partner, with a rope two days before. We climbed the route. We sort of pioneered. There are many different variations you can take. And uh, when you climb with the rope, there, there are a lot of different ways you can go and, and ways that you can climb this wall. And so we kind of chose the one that I thought was best. And I climbed it. I was like, okay, I physically can do this. And, and really, that's at the, at the base of all free soloing is you have to be able to physically do it, of course. And so I knew that I could physically do it. And then I spent the whole next day sitting in my van by myself, thinking about it, imagining, you know, trying to remember everything that we had done, thinking about what it would feel like. And then I went back the next day and, and, and climbed it again by myself without a rope. And pretty much from the beginning, it all went slightly sideways, which is... Uh, not shocking, because I was grossly unprepared. But so about, I guess about 300 meters up, the, basically in the dead center of the wall, so about 300 meters up, uh, at the last minute I decided to avoid one of the variations that I'd taken with my, with my partner two days before, uh, because I thought that it would be a little bit too physically hard, feel a little bit too insecure. And so I decided to, to take this way that went way around it, uh, this other variation that I'd read about and seen on, on Topo, seen on a map. And so I knew that there was a way around it, but I just had never done it and never practiced it. And so, and nobody ever goes that way because when you're climbing with a rope, it's a lot more direct to just go, go straight up the, the normal way. 
And so it feels all lichen-y and crunchy. You know, nobody's ever touched it. The rock feels totally virgin. It's, it's untouched by human hands, and it feels disgusting. It's hard to know if you're en route or not. And so I had this moment of being 300 meters off the ground, alone in this huge sea of granite, wondering if I was lost, wondering if I was, you know, you know I was like, oh, this is, this is not ideal. But, um, <laughs> but thankfully, I found my way back onto the route, and it, and it, it was all fine. I, mean, I actually did wind up sort of botching it a little bit, but I found my way. And, and you know, I sort of composed myself, because the, the real challenges on Half Dome are actually up at the summit, uh, right below the top. And so actually, has anyone here hiked Half Dome, of those that went to Yosemite? I felt like that's a bit, oh, I'm so proud of you. That's one. I was like, over the whole room, I was like, I hope somebody has. Because it really is, a, it's a beautiful hike, and it's actually uh, relatively commonly hiked. But, and so w when I was free soloing it, it was uh, prime tour season. It was the beginning of September. It's the weekend, so there are tons of people. And so as you're climbing on the face, you can hear people uh, you know, 50 meters above you, basically, laughing and picnicking and having a good time. And it's all slightly surreal because you're in some pretty intense climbing and you're like, oh, there are people like chuckling right above me, like, you know, chatting on their cell phone, having a nice time. It's all slightly surreal. And so the hardest part of Half Dome is, is uh, I guess, 40 meters below the summit. And it consists of, of a slab, uh, basically a smooth sheet of rock. If you imagine a, a granite countertop or something, and you tip it back to 80 degrees or so. So there's no crack in it, there are no handholds, it's just a smooth sheet of rock with little dimples and ripples and things like that. And so you're basically standing on your tiptoes on the little ripples. And so in some ways it's physically fairly easy because you're not using your muscles, you're not flexing your arms or holding anything because there's nothing to hold, you're just on your tiptoes balancing up it. But that also is the most psychologically challenging style of climbing. Because if one foothold slips, you know, if your toe slips, you're going to fall off because, you know, there's nothing else attaching you to the wall. And so when you climb it with a rope, it feels okay because you're just like, oh, a tip, tip, toe, you know, it's all good. Um, you know, it feels like climbing a really technical staircase or something. Like, really, imagine really, really thin steps that are wavy and small. <laughs> but, but then when you climb it without a rope, it's really kind of horrifying because... I mean, so it's actually, like, it's, it's worse than you might think because the thing is, if you start to... Uh, <laughs> If you, if you start to get scared, then the, the natural instinct is to lean in and try to hold on tighter, like try to clutch the rock, but there's really nothing to hold. But the more you lean in, the more likely your feet are to slip because you're now off your center of balance. Because really to stay balanced, you need to stay totally upright, stay away from the wall, you know, stay relaxed. And so as soon as you start to get scared, then your hands get sweaty and your vision starts to narrow and your legs start to shake a little bit and then they shake off the ripples, it all starts to go south. And so I'm on that slab and I get to a certain position where I had to step up onto this foothold and, and reach this, this hold. And I thought that I'd done it a certain way two days before, but then when I got there, I'd, I'd already been free soloing for uh, almost, for basically two and a half hours at that point. And this was the biggest thing that I'd done uh, up to that point in my life. And, and I was psychologically afraid. It, it was all unraveling. You know, my mind was starting to, <laughs> to come apart. I was just, I was scared. I was like, I didn't want to be there. I was like, this is terrible. And I got to this foothold and didn't really trust it. It was like, I don't know if this is the right foot. Uh, you know, and so then I started to second guess, like maybe it was this other foot, you know, because that doesn't feel right. So then I switch, and then I try that one. And I was like, well, that one feels totally off balance. Then I switch again. I'm like, maybe it was the one over here. And I'm like, that one feels even worse. And then it all starts, you know, I started to panic. It's like, oh God, I don't know which foot. I don't know what to do. And, you know, this final handhold was tantalizingly close. I mean, I just had to stand up and grab it. But all of a sudden I was like, oh, I don't know how to get there. And so, you know, to, long story short, I mean, it, so it felt like I was there a long time freaking out. Uh, you know, realistically, it's probably 30 seconds of deep breathing. Like, oh God, oh God. And then, uh, and then ultimately, I mean, I did the only thing you can really do, which is take a deep breath, compose yourself. I put the foot on, stood up, grabbed the handhold, and uh, you know, obviously the foot stayed, and I, I made it, which is why we're all, you know, having a nice chat today. And so, you know, when I grabbed the hold, super intense. I was like, duh! And so I just charged the final, you know, 30, 40 meters to the summit, and. And throughout this, I can hear people above me. You know, there are all these people up on the top hanging out. And so when I pop over the summit, I'm shirtless and I'm all jacked. I'm like, da, you know, like, <laughs> who wants some? You know, it's so amped. And uh, and it's sort of it was it was surreal because normally when you top out half dome, you have you have climbing gear and a, and a rope and all this stuff jangling around. And so tourists flock around you to take pictures, and they're like, how long did it take? That's so incredible. You climbed it. That's so amazing. But when you top out with nothing on you, people are just like, oh, that guy looks that guy looks like he's too close to the edge, you know? Like, I wonder what he's doing. It's like, you know, like, that hiker looks lost. And I was like, oh, man. So it was this really 
anticlimactic. I was like, nobody saw that? Nobody? They're like, oh. You know, and so, and I didn't have any food or water or anything. I'd just take my climbing shoes off and just walk down. I was kind of like, oh, well, that's, that's sort of disappointing. But the, but <laughs> the big, the big takeaway from a half dome for me, though, was mostly that it, you know, overall, though, the experience was not that satisfying. Uh, you know, and I talk about that because, you know, getting lost in the middle, getting scared at the top, sort of being on edge for the entire climb. You know, I climb for my own pleasure. I climb because it's fun. I climb because I enjoy the sensation of it. And if I'm up there thinking that I'm going to die for half the time and not having fun, there's no real reason to be there. And so my experience on Half Dome, you know, you know my takeaway was that I need to be a little better prepared. I need to be a little more strategic about how I do this. I need to be a little smarter about it, because obviously that's not something that I want to be repeating. Like, I don't want to be up on the side of cliffs wondering if I'm lost, wondering if I'm going to fall off, hoping that it all works out right. You know, I want to be up there feeling like I'm climbing at my best, feeling like, you know, feeling great. And, you know, Half Dome was far from that. And so, you know, the, the obvious what's next, you know, this is the photo of El Cap behind me. Uh, you know, I, I climbed Half Dome, a successful climb. You know, it wound up being on the cover of National Geographic. There was a little film about it. There, you know, there was, it, was, it was a big achievement in climbing. But the thing is, it wasn't really that, you know, I was slightly embarrassed by the whole thing. It was actually, my, my journal has a little note that had, uh, I have a journal that I've kept track of every climb I've done since 2004, uh, just so that I can learn from them. And uh, my little note had a do better question mark at the end of it, you know, because I was slightly embarrassed by the whole thing. I was like, yeah, I did it, but it wasn't ideal. And so the next obvious challenge was El Cap, but I knew that I would have to do it better. And, and it's hard to, to overstate how much of a, a jump it is from Half Dome to El Cap. It's only, uh, it's only 300 meters taller. I mean, this is a 900 meter wall. But it's much more sheer. It's much more clean. It's much more difficult. And, and the scale of it really does matter. It's just, it's just so big. I mean, so the, the average person spends four to five days to climb El Cap. Um, Actually, real, now I'm really curious. Has anyone climbed El Cap here? <laughs> Did I see? No, that guy's scratching his ear. He, he didn't climb El Cap. Um, that's, well, next time. You guys should practice. So after this, we'll walk to the climbing gym, we'll practice, and next year, we'll all talk about our experience with an El Cap. But, so people typically spend four to five days to climb the wall, which means backpacking their way up it, basically. They haul bags, they haul camping equipment. Um, not quite like this kind of camping equipment, definitely not the canoe. But, but the, same, the same style. I mean, you wind up with a lot of weight. It takes a long time. And, and as a result, probably half of people that set out to climb El Cap the first time don't actually make it to the top. They, they spend one day hauling their heavy bag. They feel totally blown out. And then they just rappel back down with all their equipment because they're like, that was way too much. And so you know, for me, growing up in a, in a world where, you know, where that's what it meant to climb El Cap, to look up at this wall and to think, oh, I'm just going to walk up there with my climbing shoes and climb it took a really, really big mental leap to even imagine that that was you know, within the, the realm of possibility. And so I basically never, I, I just didn't make that leap for many, many years. Uh, you know, starting in 2009, I thought, OK, this is the year that I'll, I'll free solo El Cap. And then every year, I'll drive into Yosemite, look at the wall, and be like, this is 100% not the year that I'm going to free solo El Cap. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to focus on other things. And so. This is just a quick montage of some of the other, other climbs that, that I did through the years. I mean, so this was in 2011, I think, for 60 minutes. And, um, and each of these climbs that I'm about to show, they each have sort of particular elements to them. I mean, so this one, you can see I'm in the sun. And this was uh, for 60 minutes, a news program. And so uh, typically, you would climb in the shade in better conditions. But because it was for this TV event thing, you know, it has to look cool. So there's kind of like, oh, well, do it in the sunset light. It'll glow orange. It'll look beautiful. And, and the thing was, this isn't quite as big as Half Dome. It's not quite as hard as Half Dome. And so I kind of felt like doing it for a camera, doing it in poor conditions, it kind of balanced out the challenge that way. You know, I was like, oh, it's easier in some ways. It's harder in others. But the key thing for me was that it was a slightly new challenge in, in a new way. And so uh, this is another climb also for 60 minutes. Again, this is a much smaller climb. This is only maybe 30 meters high. But you actually access it, but it's very hard physically. It's overhanging, and, and it's quite taxing on your arms. And you access it by rappelling in from above. And so I rappelled down into position. I held onto the crack, and then I shimmied out of my harness, you know, threw the rope and the harness away. The camera guy pulled him back up, and then I'm just kind of left alone at the bottom of this crack, being like, OK, like, here we go. This is pretty extreme. But, but obviously, it's much, much smaller than, than the things that, that I've been showing. And so again, it was kind of a new kind of challenge for me. It was something a little bit different. Uh, you know, harder in an interesting new way. 
Um, oh, I pressed a button that doesn't do anything. Here's a button that does something. So again, uh, another climb, this is, this is actually pretty small. It looks like it's really high off the ground, but there's actually a ledge kind of down below me. Um, so if you fell, you'd bounce off the ledge and then go 2,000 feet to the ground. <laughs> but, um, you know, but still, it's the little things. You're like, oh, it's not quite as bad. Uh, and again, another climb similar, uh, shorter but very severe. This is physically very difficult, but it's only, it's only 10 meters long, basically. And, and this one I'm showing because uh, it was one of the first times that I did a shoot like that. This was for a commercial, uh, for a television commercial, and so you can see the crane and the whole crazy situation above me filming it. And so to do a climb like this uh, for a camera, it, again, in full sun, you can tell it's like, and, and this was in September, the sun was super hot, it was kind of terrible conditions. But again, I, was, I kind of took on that extra challenge intentionally because you know, I knew in the back of my mind that if I ever wanted to free solo bigger and harder things, things like El Cap, I, I needed to be able to do something like this easily, you know, sort of on command. And so I, t I saw this commercial as a good opportunity to sort of test myself in a different way. So, quick picture of my home, uh, which is actually now my guest bedroom, because now that I own a home, this just sits out on the driveway for guests. And actually, I think Doria stayed in, stayed in the guest bedroom. But, um, so, the beauty of, of van life or, or just the thing that I really got from living in a van for, uh, I don't know, 12 years maybe, or 10, you know, 10 or 12 years, was the, the simplicity of it, the way it distilled my whole life down to exactly what it was that I was working on. And all of these climbs that I've showed so far have all been in Yosemite. And so I was living in this car in Yosemite. Well, actually, I was living in the small, this is my new van, which is, you can at least stand up in, and it's a lot more comfortable. My old van was pretty scrappy. And uh, you couldn't stay, you know, I just lived like this for, for nine years. And now I have chronic back pain, but uh, I, I don't actually. But So the, uh, the point of van life, though, is that your world is so contracted that it forces you to focus on exactly, it forces you to focus your time on exactly what you want to spend it on. And so for me, that was climbing. You know, I'm living in Yosemite. The van is, is pretty uncomfortable, and so I spend my whole day doing the thing that I want to do, which is work on these climbs, train for these climbs, and, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm like, yeah. How many of you guys have lived in vans if we're doing that? Is that I see one. That, oh, no, I see two. That's, that's cool. Okay. Um, I feel like you're halfway to climbing El Cap. You just need to go <laughs> park below El Cap for a while. And, and so you guys know that the living demand really does simplify your life and help you focus on, on the things that are important to you. That said, you know, I knew that from time to time I had to get away from the van to keep broadening my comfort zone, and that meant expeditions in other parts of the world. And so this is a photo from Oman. I mean, you know, the, the van is great, but only climbing in Yosemite doesn't allow me to practice all types of rock, all types of terrain, new types of experience. I mean, a lot of climbing for me is about learning new things and, and pushing myself. And so, you know, that requires going further afield. And so this is, uh, this is a photo from Oman, and um, I think in a little while I'll be chatting with Greg, Michelle, and Dory, and talking a little more about the foundation and, and uh, some of where that came from. But, but a lot of my motivation to start the foundation came from some of these expeditions to other parts of the world, and, and realizing, you know, there are a billion people on Earth without access to power, and sort of seeing that need. And, um, you know, I mean, it's a long story, but basically the, this trip to Oman, uh, the communities that we, we were living on a catamaran for three weeks, sailing around the Strait of Hormuz, which is this terror, tiny, narrow point uh, on the edge of, you know, Oman. And, and so uh, all the communities were totally off-grid, uh, running off diesel generators, really small fishing communities. It's sort of like a strategic outpost almost for Oman to, to control this strait because of the bulk of the world's oil supply goes by there. Anyway. The point was like trips like this helped me start to care about the broader world in a, in a bigger sense, and, and that's part of where the foundation came from. But I also included this photo from Amman because when I talk about the why of climbing or the why of free soloing, I think this photo actually, for whatever reason, I've always really liked it. This is just some random picture that my friend took on his phone, and uh, this isn't some proud, difficult climb. This is just something that we saw while we were hiking by, and so I ran over, climbed it, took a picture, and came back down. It's all pretty casual. but. <laughs> Well, it's, it's easier than it looks. Um, but the thing is, this photo reminds me of the very big and the very small, which is really what I love about free soloing, is the feeling of, of grandeur and bigness. I mean, so w when I'm climbing 
some of these walls by myself. In some ways, it's, it's when I feel my absolute biggest. It's when I'm doing what I do best, and I feel like I'm doing it well, and I feel like the man. You know, I'm hanging on some crazy clip. I'm like, this is amazing. No one's ever done this. I feel incredible. But at the same time, I feel completely insignificant because some of these walls are so big, and you're such a tiny little speck. And you know that, you know, I know that if I fell off, I would bounce a couple times, I'd hit the ground, I'd be done, and the mountain would not care. You know, like the, the, the valley, the life in the valley would go on, the animals would come and great, you know, bears would, in Yosemite, bears would come and eat what was left, actually, which, is, which has actually happened in Yosemite, it's super grim. But um, anyway, well, but, but honestly, but the awareness of that, though, is exactly what I mean. I mean, that is the smallness of it, remembering your place in nature, remembering that I am an insignificant speck in the cosmos. But at the same time, while, while thinking of that, also feeling like I am leading my best life. You know, in that moment when you're hanging on the wall, you can be like, this is incredible, and I'm doing something that I've trained my whole life for. And so that combination of very big and very small at the same time is, is a big part of what I've always loved about free soloing. And so part of that, that grandness, that scale of climbing can really be found in the big mountains. And so I just have a couple pictures here from, from trips to Patagonia in southern Argentina. And again, this some of the expeditions further afield. And the thing about these climbs, so in the, in the background, actually, Ben from Patagonia, um, for those that know Patagonia, the Patagonia logo is the Fitzroy Massif, the, the whole range. So all these peaks behind me, that is the Patagonia logo seen from the other side. So a partner and I traversed all seven of those peaks over four and a half days. And at the time, it was maybe the biggest climbing adventure I'd ever had. And, and the big mountain in the middle, uh, Fitzroy, uh, that's a, about a 5,000 foot face. I'm, I'm now totally out of, out of metric, but that's okay. Um, but so it's almost, almost twice as big as El Cap. And so even though it's quite a bit easier in a lot of ways, the, the climbing is technically easier and, and less demanding, the scale of it is truly something else. And so, you know, from albinism, you know, these types of big climbs in the mountains is just another way for me to be totally out of my comfort zone, learning something new, and just continuing to, to broaden myself as a climber in different directions. And then I included this just because, again, it's broadening in a totally different direction of climbing. Uh, and actually, in a lot of ways, the thing that I find most difficult about climbing in urban settings is just having so many people stare at you like, you're a weirdo while you climb. Because typically in nature, you're just out by yourself, it's totally peaceful, it's relaxing, you go at your own pace. But then when you're on a city sidewalk, everyone's staring at you, being like, that guy's a psycho, what's wrong with that guy? And you're just like, oh, like, you know, but it, so it's stressful in a totally different way. And yet still a way for me to learn something new about my climbing and, and to, to, to improve as a climber, basically. And so at the end of this journey, you know, a bunch of expeditions around the world, different types of trips, different climbs in Yosemite. At a certain point in 2015, I was in Yosemite climbing with some friends, and, and I had the first time of, of looking up at El Cap and actually thinking, I might actually be able to free solo that. You know, I said that starting in 2009, I'd, I thought that I should solo it. But it wasn't until 2015 that I actually looked at it and thought, you know what, that might actually be possible. I might be able to free solo that. And part of that was because you know, I had now climbed things that were harder technically. I'd climbed things that were bigger in some ways. You know, obviously I hadn't done anything quite like El Cap, but, all the, but if I broke it down into small enough elements, I had actually done many of those elements. And so I was like, well, if I break the, the problem down into small enough pieces, I can actually do many of those pieces. So I was like, okay, you know, it might be possible. And I remember it was a very specific moment that I was just like, oh, this could actually be a thing for me. And, and that's actually where the film picks up, for those that have seen Free Solo. Um, the filmmakers, Jimmy Chin and Chai Vassarelli, the, the co-directors, they actually happened to approach me at, at pretty much that same moment. And so it was, you know, in some ways serendipitous because I was finally starting to believe that this thing that I'd been dreaming about for so many years might be possible. And then they also came to me and, and wanted to do a film project. And so it was kind of perfect for me to bring those together and be like, okay, well, let's do a film project about this thing that I want to work on for the next couple years. And so, uh, you know, spoiler for those that haven't seen the film. Obviously, I successfully free soloed all cap. This is <laughs> this is a this is a photo from uh, from near the top of the wall. And uh, for for those that haven't seen the film, I, I basically put two years of effort into it. In in strong contrast to my experience on Half Dome, where I put put two days of effort into it. And and by the end of it, it really was the most satisfying climb of my life. I mean, this is me summiting El Cap. It's probably the happiest I've ever been climbing. And when I think about it still, I've, yeah, actually, it'll be exactly two years uh, ago in next week, or the week after, in two weeks, I guess. So it's been two years, and it's still the most satisfying climb I've ever had. And, and I'm, I'm proud of it in a way that I haven't been proud of any other climbs, really, you know, because I put so much effort into it. 
And so, well, so bring that back to the why, I'm like, I don't know why, you know? I was like, I think, uh, I think Greg's gonna come out and chat with me around the fire, and hopefully he will save me from, from the why of all these things. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, here, here, help me chat. Gonna, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, you know. Yeah, you hey, should uh, be. Yeah. That was amazing, everybody. No, no, thanks. Right? Uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Let's have a seat. Let's yeah. have a chat. <laughs>